we now have a snivel service, a woke blob, whatever you want to call them, working in tandem with the mainstream media in this country. And I think that is something that the Conservative Party really need to start thinking about. Our institutions, let's be honest, this is about our established institutions, they have a particular dislike to the Conservative Party, that's self-evident. Um, but also, it's not just about us, you know, us as a party, it's what we stand for, it's our beliefs. We got an 80-seat majority, but yet you think about the way in which, dare I say, the machinery of the state responds, no. You know, everything is like computer says no. You can't do this. Rather than how can we help you to deliver on your priorities? Because it feels to me like what the Conservative Party leadership and certainly the Parliamentary Party have decided to do is give in to this blob. Now, my argument, Pretty, would be they don't want to work with you. They want to destroy you. So do you think the Parliamentary leadership needs to change its approach? You can be strong as a leader, as a Secretary of State, to get what you need out of the system. I'm going to call it the system because, quite frankly, it is. It's the state, the civil service, government departments, everything that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and woker, as we know. But, you know, as a political leader, we can't also just sort of attribute blame for our own failures because, at the end of the day, we were the ones with the mandate. And it's maybe the first time that the rest of the media is thinking, actually... This coup didn't work last year because do you agree with me that the local election results were an unmitigated disaster for Rishi Sunak and the Conservative Party and make it very likely that unless there is change, which is obviously what this conference is about, you are facing a thumping at the general election under Rishi Sunak? So we want to avoid that. The election results were terrible for us as a party, collectively. And as I've said earlier on in my remarks, there's a range of reasons for that. Last year had a lot to do with it. You know, people feel disillusioned. Our members feel disillusioned. They think that, you know, parliamentary party does not represent the views of the majority of our grassroots. I can concur with that as well. You know, a lot of people I meet every day say this too. So we can change this by mobilising the base, being honest, being truthful, being respectful, not trying to, you know, cancel everybody out. Um, and also, remember, we've just lost over a 1,000 councillors. And I do feel strongly about that because I believe in Conservative representation. Now, I've spoken to a lot of senior Conservatives in Westminster over the past week in preparation for today. And they tell me of a fear that Rishi Sunak doesn't believe he can win the next election and that he is preparing to lose in a dignified manner. What's your take on that? I mean, look, come on. You cannot be leader of our great, successful political party and not have hunger, drive, ambition to do the best that you possibly can for our amazing country, right? Because you talked earlier in your speech about a fear of managed decline. So what can he do specifically to turn that around? Stand up for conservatism. So we've heard consistently today, we know what we stand for, and also we are patriotic, we love our country, you know, we believe that we can be better as a nation. And that also means speaking to the hopes and aspirations of the British people. And quite frankly, that is the most exciting thing about being in politics, right? The battle of ideas. Okay, let's talk about the big blonde elephant in the room because he might not be here today but all you need to do is speak to any of the activists here today or look at the results of the GB News poll which we've had running in the foyer all day and over 90% of people here say that they are team Boris rather than team Rishi <laughs> isn't isn't the solution obvious, Pretty? We had an extraordinary success in the 2019 general election, but we got an 80-seat majority, and we won in parts of the country which had been untouched from conservatism 
for decades, actually, there were some parts of the country that hadn't seen a Conservative MP since Margaret Thatcher, since 83. And we do owe Boris a debt of gratitude for that. And there are MPs in Westminster today that have to recognise that they're only MPs for the constituencies that they represent because of Boris. He is an electoral asset, in my view. London's been a tough gig for our party, right? But he was able to, you know, win in parts off the country, like London, where other Conservatives have failed. We're going to need him, we will need him to come back and re galvanise and re energise the grassroots as we go into an election. A leadership challenge before I, the next I, I'll election. be very candid. I don't think that's going to do us the world of good at all. And partly because of everything that the public saw last year. In parts of my constituency, bring back Boris. People were saying that to me very actively and feeling quite embarrassed about what has happened over the last 12 months. We have ejected, you know. In, in succession now, democratically elected leaders of our party. It happened to Margaret Thatcher. It happened to Boris. In my view, Boris would have won us the next election. It also happened to his successor, you know, a couple but, of months but, later, but, but and that could not be right. But couldn't he still win you the next election? Isn't that the point? Well, <laughs> there you go, there you go. I mean, I just don't see, you know, the public right now, with where we are, we've got a job of work to do. As I've said, our reputation has taken a batter in. It really has. So we have to rebuild off the back of these local elections. There's no doubt about it. This party gate witch hunt, as I call it, has not ended. The Kangaroo Court of the Privileges Committee is yet to rule. Now, it was reported late last week that Harriet Harman and Sue Gray, Sue Gray, who is about to be Keir Starmer's chief of staff, met secretly in the preparation for this Privileges Committee. Why do you think there's not much focus on that, and does it not seem corrupt to you? It just seems totally wrong. Totally, totally wrong. It really does. Corruption, collusion, the lack of transparency, and... This is a very sensitive subject in Westminster because it is the privileged, Privileges Committee. We all have to be very careful about how we refer to people and the c committee, etc. But, you know, transparency is important. And there has been zero transparency. There's been too much hearsay, meetings behind closed doors. And in a way in which, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, this has been a very degrading process, hasn't it? Very humiliating and just not right for, for what, some... For a piece of cake. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, Pretty, can you understand the anger when you look at what's going on in Scotland yeah. with the SNP yeah, right. and scheming Sturgeon yeah. and the media for two years have not reported on that when they were obsessed with a piece of cake? So this does come back, Dan, though, doesn't it, to your point when we started the discussion? this afternoon about the mainstream media, how selective yep. it has been in terms of filtering information, yep. the lack of focus, you know, lack of focus on Scotland, SNP, Sturgeon, because and then zero in. in Scotland. It's I outrageous. Mean, it's extraordinary. And quite undemocratic, again, yeah. and involving all sorts of, you know, issues now. It looks like co corruption, basically, mm. as well, in, you know, the bowels of that particular party. Um, and that will have big consequences at the general election. That could basically change the electoral composition of our country as well. So this matters when it comes to the health and well-being of the United Kingdom, the integrity of our democracy. There should be full scrutiny as to what has happened there. Has Kemi Badenoch committed a Brexit betrayal this week? I do feel very strongly that at the end of the day we promised that we were going to have the bonfire of regulations. I was in government for over three years and there was a lot of work that took place department by department, per department, on literally getting ready, you know, doing the whole track of, you know, what was going to go, um, what would be repealed, and all of this just seems to have just disappeared. Now, that might be the civil service, but as I said, you know, as politicians, we have to lead to governors to choose. You cannot start diluting at this stage of a parliament when this parliament was elected to deliver on getting rid of these laws. And again, this is about trust. If we do not deliver, the British public will say, well, you know, what have you been doing for three years? You've betrayed us. You've let us down. And look, finally, I just want to ask you the question that I've been asking all of these great folk today. Uh, team Boris or Team Rishi? We're all Conservatives, right? We've got to focus on winning. And look, I, I am a massive supporter of Boris. There's no doubt about that. You know, I'm deeply loyal as well on that basis. I was very loyal to Boris and I would not change my position by the way. I really wouldn't. 
Um, he gave me the greatest privilege. I served in government alongside him as his Home Secretary. But right now, we've got to focus on winning. We've got to focus on rebuilding for decades to make sure that we have a say on the leadership, to make sure that you have a say on selections, to make sure your democratic voices are heard and that makes a difference. So thank you so much for all of your support Team today. Thank, thank you for being here as well.